I, I think you're a very intuitive person and you're sort of psychologically wired. You know, I mean, we've talked enough to realize that beyond politics and beyond COVID or the border or any of this stuff or the next election, there's a kind of a, a psychodynamic pursuit where you're just sort of like, I kind of want to know who a person is and what motivates them. I'm, I'm interested in this experiment that we're all conducting here called life and human beings and interactions. And you're, I think of you as a very intuitive person that way. So what was your just general vibe from Putin just being in the same room with him? Well, a couple of things. I mean, and I, I've said this many times, nobody believes me, but I really didn't know very much about the current state. Well, I knew very little about the current state of Russia. It's not my area. I'm not a Russian speaker. So I was, and I had read about Putin, of course, as people who try to be informed do, but I, I'm not an expert in Putin. I'm not now an expert on Putin. So I didn't really know what to think. And I was trying to shut out all the preconceptions because you should do that and come to things fresh if you can. And so my view was, um, one, he seemed a little more amped up uh, a little more anxious than I imagined he would be. He did not. Um, he seemed he seemed like the kind of person who prepared overly much mm -hmm. and had something to say, and he was going to kind of repeat it. He calmed down. It was over two hours, um, the conversation on camera. So uh, he did calm down. So that's the first thing. I was I was surprised by that. Uh, second, I thought that he seemed legitimately wounded by the rejection of the West. I mean, I don't think there's any, you can watch it. I think it's obvious in there. He is famous for his emotional control. He's not an emoter. Um, if he had ADHD, he wouldn't tell you. But what did come through for sure is that his feelings were, I don't know, feelings were hurt. He was stung by the rejection of the West. And, and I certainly understand why the West has rejected Russia. It doesn't want anything to do with Russia. He asked to join NATO. He asked to join in a joint missile a treaty with the United States and let's aim all our missiles at Iran. He pitched us to George W. Bush, who accepted it. And then Condi Rice, one of the dumbest people in American foreign policy, convinced him that, no, we have to hate Russia. And so from his perspective, it's like, well, why? Why wouldn't it be better to be allies? You know, why are you trying to put nuclear weapons on my border? These are real questions. And it's not enough to dismiss anyone who asked them as a tool of Russia. Of course, I'm not a tool of Russia. Um, I'm an American in every sense. Uh, and I'm, in fact, I'm so American that I forced myself to go to Russia at, at my own expense, booked it myself to the interview because I have a right to do it. And, and I think it's important to preserve that right by exercising it. I have a right to speak to anyone I want and to gather any information I feel I need in order to make decisions about how my government's performing because it's a democracy. OK, that's my opinion. So I'm very American. But I look at this and I'm like, what's the answer? Why, if Russia asked to join NATO 24 years ago, why couldn't they join NATO? And if they want to join a, in a missile agreement with us to protect our mutual interests from Iran, why did we turn them down? And why are we expanding NATO eastward? And why are we trying to put nuclear weapons on their western border? And once we try to do that, why are we surprised that they react with violence as they did? And to what extent did we anticipate they were going to invade Ukraine when we tried to push Ukraine into NATO? Well, of course, you know the answers to all of these questions. And the answer to the last question is, we knew they were going to do that. And that's why we were publicly pushing Ukraine to join NATO. The Biden administration wanted this war because they thought that they could destabilize Russia and get rid of Putin and put in someone more compliant. That's the truth. Now, whether you think it's a good idea or a bad idea, it's revealing of their deep ignorance and their hubris are just very stupid, unimpressive people is part of the answer to all of these questions. They just, they can't see the big picture and they don't really care about American interests. But that was their plan. They did this, okay? So when you read some court stenographer from the Associated Press or Reuters, one of these other, you know, mindless, truly mindless state media organizations calling this an unprovoked war of aggression, it was not an unprovoked war of aggression. It was a very much provoked war of aggression. Doesn't mean it was justifiable. Doesn't mean it was a good idea. It was not a good idea. I'm not backing the war in Ukraine. I wish it hadn't happened. But it was provoked, and it was provoked by the Biden administration and by the vice president of the United States, Carmela Harris, Carmela, whatever we're calling her now, Harris, at the Munich Security Conference when she said at a press conference, we want you, Zelensky, to join NATO. And days later, Russia moved over the border. So 
one led to the other, and they knew that it would when they sent their little moron, their little puppet over there to say this in public. I mean, sure, she doesn't know, right. you know, and she doesn't know anything, but she was a tool for them to get that message in order to provoke the response that they got. And like, there's kind of no debate about that, actually, at this point. No honest person can look at the facts and reach another conclusion, in my opinion. And if they can, then what's the other conclusion? Tell me, tell me how I'm wrong. But no one will ever tell you how you're wrong. They just try to assassinate your character, or try and kill you, uh, like they did to Gonzalo Lira, an American citizen murdered in Ukraine by the Ukrainian government with the backing of the Biden administration because he complained. Wasn't there an attempt on you? Wasn't there a car bomb or something? Did I catch that? What was that? Yep. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna pass on that question. Um, I get but it. But look, the point is the point is that there is no Ukrainian government. It's an annex of the State Department. It's run by the State Department and by our intel services. The New York Times had a big piece on this the other day, but it was very obvious from the very beginning that this is a proxy war waged by a proxy government against a sovereign state. Okay, the sovereign state's Russia. The non-sovereign state is Ukraine. It's not a sovereign state. It's run by the United States, by the Biden administration, and by Toria Nuland, who just resigned today. So I don't want any of this to be true. I don't like being mad at my government. I am an American. I look forward to a day where I can be proud of my government because it acts in the interest of my country and not in the interest of some sort of weird multinational cabal with its own interests, which is clearly what's happening, obviously. But that's just a fact. So anybody who writes in a news story, the unprovoked war of aggression against Ukraine is just lying. You're just a liar. So why don't you go do something that, you know, why don't you go sell timeshares or something where you're allowed to lie? <laughs> do, do you know what I mean? Like, right. why are you in the news business where, oh, where honesty is the most important quality? It's, it's table stakes. If you're not honest, you can't be in this business. And if you're a committed liar, then you definitely can't be in this business.